This was years ago when I was living in a different city. I hadn't really been on my own all that long, and my housing situation fell apart at the last minute, so I had to scramble to figure it out. Meaning, you guessed it, random roommates. Now, the year before, I'd had a random roommate that was the most amazing person ever, and ended up becoming a really great friend, so I figured this would be the same. It wasn't, but that's actually not the focus of this story. Enter the roommates. Ben, who I did actually know a bit from the previous year and was becoming great friends with, and Tom and Mike. Now, this was the very first couple of days after moving in, and we'd all hung out and gotten to know each other, but Tom and Mike hadn't fully moved in yet. It was a big old house separated by floor and the top level locked at the stairs. This is important to note. Ben and I lived upstairs with Tom and Mike downstairs. I've always been paranoid and definitely have good reason. So when I'm home, all doors are locked. When I leave, all the doors are locked. And when I sleep, my bedroom locked. I was home alone with Ben at work and Tom and Mike sort of in and out moving stuff in. I'll note that both had a lot of expensive stuff, like in the five figure range. Well, I was watching something on my laptop in my room, bedroom locked and both entrances to my part of the house locked. I started hearing a lot of noise coming from downstairs, sounded like doors and cupboards opening, furniture moving around, etc. I figured it's just Tom or Mike, until I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I was technically supposed to be somewhere at that time, which they knew, but it had been cancelled at last minute, so no one would have known I was home and they had no reason to come upstairs when they knew that both of us were supposed to be gone. That was when I got panicky, hearing them closer and closer to the top of the stairs. I never sat so still. Then the knob began to jiggle. I could hear it clearly as my room was closest to the entryway. At this point, I'm on the phone with 911 whispering that someone's in my house without giving away that I'm there to whoever it was. The house was super close to downtown, and the cops arrived in mere minutes, but they were the longest of my life at that moment. The downstairs was completely ransacked, like something right out of a movie. It was just so surreal to see. They had taken over 20 grand in electronics. I honestly don't remember the exact amount, just about the amount that I think. Broken furniture, plates and stuff, even rips through the mattresses. Turned out, Tom and Mike had left a door unlocked when moving. This would not be the last time before I fled this house. They were gone before the cops showed up, so I'd spend the next several months afraid they'd come back, though it would turn out to be the least of my future worries. I'm so glad that I always locked the doors. Considering the way the downstairs looked, I don't know what they would have done to me. To whoever was on the other side of the thankfully locked door, I'm really glad you weren't able to get into my room. This is so bizarre. This isn't even a memory I forgot, just one that I basically turned into my own fun anecdote to make it less scary. 11 years later, it's still freaking scary, and I know just how lucky I was. For context, I was a fresh 21-year-old and had recently discovered a love of dance and had started really enjoying concerts and festivals. I had attended my first festival at 20 and had the most amazing time volunteering and meeting new people. It was a last-minute and unexpected situation that first year, but after the amazing experience I had, I was hooked. It's prudent to add that I was extremely naive and obviously new to that kind of scene. So the next year I had to cut off the friends I'd gone to festivals with before, but still had friends of friends that went that I got along with really well and had good memories with. So even though I was going my second year at the same festival, I was going solo and just camping with friends of friends, which I suppose was the beginning of the problem. I got going kind of late, so when I got to the festival the lines to get in were extremely long. I'd packed diligently but the service wasn't great and I was having a hard time contacting my friends that I was camping with. By the time I had found them and it set up, it was dark. It was a newer but pretty large festival 
and I had a really bad sense of direction. In future years, I'd learned to bring battery and solar lights and obnoxious decorations because of this night. It was also in a different location that year. So, unfamiliar with where I'm camped with my surroundings. The second part where I messed it up. My ex-roommate Tom and his girlfriend Gina were the ones I was closest to, and Tom was bringing some special acid for me. As kind of an apology for not sticking up for me in a roommate situation. We all went to the first show together, but all got really high so fast. I took too much, and I knew it was pretty quickly, so I knew the night was going to go sideways. But by the time I realized Tom and Gina had wandered off, leaving me completely alone. I tried to find my way to my tent, thinking I'd lay down for a bit and be okay. But I couldn't figure out how to get to it or where it was. It was dark, and I was starting to panic. Being that I was high as hell and didn't know where anyone I knew was, I didn't know how to find my campsite or anything. I was in a crop top and jean shorts and high desert at nighttime, so I was starting to get cold. I wandered over to the disco area because it was the first thing I found. Had a legit disco ball and everything. I'm wandering around and I saw this woman in the most unusual clothing. Think almost pioneer. So I went to talk to her. I genuinely to this day don't know if this person was real. That's how messed up I was. We end up wandering around. Again, not really sure this was a real person or a hallucination. And I'm trying to find my campsite when we reach the RV and car and camp area. This man, maybe early 30s with glow sticks, asked if we want any. And we say hell yeah. She goes first. And as soon as it's on her wrist, goes skipping away. I call out to her to wait. But she doesn't stop. The man then looks at me and says, Are you okay? Do you think you can find your friend? I then stupidly say, Oh, I don't really know her really. I can't find my campsite and she was helping, but oh well. He responds with, You remind me a lot of my little sister. I wouldn't want her running around lost like this. Look, my buddy are gonna go watch these shows, and I wouldn't feel right leaving you, so you could just stay in his RV for a few hours to sleep it off. Obviously, I was too high, too young, too naive to see where this would go, and I stupidly complied and followed him. It was fine at first. It was a toy hauler, I think that's what it's called, so the back end was like a U-Haul that stayed open. The first guy put on an album that I had previously really loved as a teenager, but now can barely even listen to. He then tucked me in and left. I didn't see his buddy at that point. Fast forward God knows how many hours, I've been tripping out listening to this music and actually been getting to the point of feeling okay when they get back. For the record, I didn't request this particular band. It was an loop. The first thing I know was the guy that told me that I looked like his sister is climbing on top of me while I was half conscious, kissing my neck and touching me. Then I felt the second one, and his hands. I was still so high and out of it, but immediately told them to stop, that I wasn't in a place for that. They got angry, and the one who'd gotten me there was the most frightening. I saw his eyes change in that moment, and I knew I was screwed if I couldn't get away. It didn't matter how high I was. I needed to get away from them. I don't even recall formulating a plan. I remember the man then saying, We helped you. Now you owe us. And then slamming my knee into his groin. I may have forgotten that he was on top of me at that point. All I remember is running for my life into the very prickly bushes, not knowing where I was going but desperately running away. The man seemed a bit nervous about the whole thing and didn't do much except touch me while the other one held me down with the weight of his body. I met a couple of kind souls that calmed me down when I was completely freaking out, crying covered in dirt and thorns, and they gave me a safer space. I didn't sleep that night at all, as I could no longer trust the kind stranger, but I also couldn't find my camp. It was ten yards away as I discovered the next day. So, to the two men who tricked me and trapped me and would have done something inevitably bad to me, screw you both, and I hope I never see either of you again. Update. I forgot to add this part because it's a pretty intense memory for me, but I'm pretty sure the only reason I got away is because they were on something. 
I hadn't even met guy number two before, so I don't know much about him, but the one I did seemed crazed and very amped and high and out of it. And yes, I know the whole thing was really stupid of me. I was not even a full month into 21 though, with very little life experience. I'm a teenager who helps his dad out on the allotment. If you don't know, an allotment is like a mini farm. You can plant veggies, have animals like chickens or rabbits to care for, etc. This happened recently and this still creeps me out. In the evening, my dad says we need to go to the allotment to feed our chickens as he forgot to feed them earlier that day. It was around 8pm when I agreed and went in the car and started driving. When we got to our allotment, which is like a 15 minute drive, it was already dark outside. Not a lot, but dark. I opened the gates to the allotment, let my dad drive in, and then closed them. As I was about to though, I saw a black car outside. The car belonged to a guy that used to be chill with my dad, but they both kind of fell from talking to each other. My dad said he was becoming more mentally ill as the guy had a divorce and got his kids taken away from him by the mother. The guy lives on the allotment now, even sleeping there. Remember, there's other people there too on this allotment area, around 20 other ones, but there was no one else except for me, my dad, and the guy. After my dad parked the car, we got out and started getting the food for the chickens out of the trunk. While my dad was doing that, I had looked at his ex-friend's allotment only to see him staring right at us. It was dark, so I could only see a shadow of him, but I knew he was staring at us. I got a gut feeling but decided to ignore it. We went to the allotment, fed the chickens, and were about to go home until my dad almost forgot about something. I went to the shed at the end of the allotment to fetch something, and I was going to enter but had a feeling to wait out instead. As I asked my dad how much longer until he finds what he needs, I turned back to face our gate being opened. I didn't see it at first, but I saw the guy trying to enter our allotment quietly. He stared at me and then slowly closed the gate before just disappearing. I didn't react or say anything. I just stood there. I thought of telling my dad, but I didn't want to scare him or anything. In the end, this isn't a horror movie where I should scream like a girl. That was when my dad left the shed, and now we could go. As we were leaving, we had heard a sound like an axe hitting wood nonstop. We knew that something was wrong. We then quickly walked to our car, started it, and went to the gate. I left the car, creeped out of the guy being around in the allotment. I quickly opened the gate and let my dad drive through. As I was closing the gate, I saw something that terrified me on the spot. The guy was just standing there 20 meters away from me looking at me. I couldn't see any details but just darkness on him. He was holding something in his hand, but then he just moved and went into some bushes. My dad got out of the car to lock the gate, and he looked at the bushes through the closed gate and then rushed to his car. When we left and started driving, I had asked my dad if he saw what I saw. He said that he saw him hiding in the bushes, squatting and looking at us. Dad said he saw him holding something too, like an axe or a knife or something. We left terrified, but we tried to laugh it off, knowing we were probably close to being attacked or worse, dead. We came back to the allotment at the same time around 8pm a few days after what happened. We saw the guy's car in the allotment, and we knew we needed to be quick with feeding the chickens. As we did so, everything was going fine until we were about to leave. My dad stopped me, and we hid over a blue shed. My dad then told me, He's there. He's in the bushes. My heart dropped. I told my dad where he was, and he said five second walk and we're done. We quickly ran to the car, closed it, and drove off. For a second, I saw him. He had an axe. He wanted to sneak up on us, harm us. He wanted to kill us. Back in 2013, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and had moved there for a new job. It was just me living there in a quaint and spacious townhouse with my then four-year-old daughter. We were relatively new to the area, 
and we didn't know many people, but did become familiar with the kind older gentleman who lived next door. His name for the purpose of this story was Ben. We lived in a connected townhouse with our other two units abutting each other. Our street was lined with beautiful floral trees and was quite nice, but Providence is weird in that the conditions of the houses and little neighborhoods can vary drastically street by street. We were near a few rough neighborhoods, but I felt relatively safe in my new home. I remember a few nights prior to this specific night, I saw a Facebook post with a safety tip to put your car keys next to your bedside, so if anything ever happens, you can press the alarm and then scare off an intruder. I've never been overly concerned about my safety, and I rarely took advantage of any tips that I saw on Facebook, so I'm not sure how or why that I suddenly decided to heed this advice. I was reading a book in bed with my light on in my second floor bedroom hours after putting my daughter to sleep when I heard a loud sound outside. I peered out the window to take a look and saw nothing. I had taken some melatonin that evening, so I turned off the light and went to sleep. It was maybe half an hour or so later when I was suddenly woken up by what felt like almost an earthquake. The room shook and I heard a loud thud. Half awake, I gasped and sat up wondering if it was just my imagination or if I actually felt something and immediately ran to my daughter's room thinking she had fallen off her bed or injured herself or something. As I swung her door wide open, there she was, sleeping soundly and sweetly. I was so confused. I heard another loud bang and then this eerie feeling that something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what. I grabbed my car key fob and took it downstairs as I nervously expected the first floor. I swore to myself if I heard one more sound, I would press the alarm just in case, but I didn't. It was silent after that. I returned to bed and took a while to fall asleep again, but soon shut my eyes. The next day went on like any other, when I had noticed a friend of mine had repeatedly called me in the afternoon. I picked up my daughter from preschool and then called the friend back. Did you hear? He said. Um, no. What? I answered. News outlets were mopping your street about an hour ago, and the news trucks were even in your driveway. I sat silent, confused. Three men broke into your neighbor's place last night. They tied him up at gunpoint and stole thousands of dollars worth of items, and then took off with his car. I immediately fell to my knees and began sobbing. I heard it all happen. I almost pressed the button. Almost, but I didn't. I sobbed and felt completely unsafe. I asked a friend to come over for the night to stay with us, and it wasn't until the next day that I got the chance to speak to Ben. Ben explained the whole story, and he told me the cops wanted to talk to me so I could share what I had heard and experienced. He said that the men smashed his window in his basement and entered through there. That's the sound I heard before going to bed. Apparently the timeline suggested that they saw my light and me peering out the window and waited 30 minutes or so until my light was out to enter the premises. They didn't realize he was home, and since he had gone to bed early that night, it was suggested they inspected his place beforehand. He had been asleep when one of them was rummaging through his stuff upstairs in his bedroom, which was directly on the other side of my closet through a shared wall. The sounds and shakes that I heard and felt were apparently the intruder knocking him down to the ground after realizing Ben was there, and then cupping his mouth to tell him if he made another sound, he would kill him. This is why I never heard another sound as I was investigating thereafter. After they tied him up, he remained tied up for over 12 hours, and eventually broke free before calling the police. I cried again and apologized profusely to Ben, and explained what I had heard and he simply said that as he was tied up, all he could think about was that he was glad that it didn't happen to me and my little girl. I really don't know what I would have done if my daughter and I had to experience that level of trauma firsthand. Ben seemed to be okay considering it all, but it took me so long to feel safe again and for the guilt to subside. They never caught the guys, and I ended up ordering a taser and some mace, and even for the first time in my life, considered getting a gun but ultimately decided against it. I've been very fortunate to never experience anything close to that again, and certainly don't want to. I'm really glad Ben was ultimately okay, 
but the next time I'll listen to my instincts. It's better to be safe than to be sorry. This happened like six to seven years ago now. Feel free to ask any questions. I played soccer for one year in community college after high school. I knew this guy because he worked for the athletics department. He was another student. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I had a one hour gap between classes. This guy noticed me in the library and he asked what I was doing there. I told him I had an hour long gap and he had started coming regularly to hang out. I didn't mind because he seemed like a normal guy. He wasn't waiting for anything, but he just wanted to hang out. He brought me little gifts a few times, like chocolate and stuff. He was being a little too sweet for someone that I barely knew. I didn't even think about red flags. With the gifts, I remember that he always downplayed it. He'd be like, They had extra Kit Kat bars today in the office. Do you want some? He never said that he purposely bought a Kit Kat for me. I know a lot more about boys now than I knew back then. I think he knew that buying me gifts would be too much, but still wanted to do it without doing it. The soccer season for us ended before Thanksgiving. The only teams that kept playing after that were going to the playoffs, not us. But after Thanksgiving, we had finals. In that brief period after the soccer season, but before Thanksgiving, he had asked me about my classes for second semester. To be honest, I hadn't been super organized with course registration, and I honestly didn't know. Also, the counselors were completely clueless. I didn't tell him that, but I remember saying that I didn't want to have another gap hour like this because it just wasted so much time. I don't think he was happy to hear that. He asked if I would play another season, and I said no to that. I needed to manage my time better, and playing soccer every day was not helping. I think my mistake was that I just said too much, unfiltered. I used to do that a lot back then, saying way too much without thinking about how it can affect another person's feelings. This was on the last Thursday before Thanksgiving, so no more hour gaps to hang out anymore. We had Thanksgiving break, we took finals, and we had winter break. Everything was great. Winter break was when the real problem started. In the mornings, this guy literally showed up outside my house while sitting in his car. The first time, I didn't believe it was actually him. The second time, I checked, and it was. By then, it was really clear that we both knew what was going on. He was stalking me, and that wasn't all. I posted on my Instagram story sometimes, and about the places I was at. This guy literally showed up there several times like girly stores at the mall where he had zero business being. He did lots of things like that. He also started pointing his phone at me like he was taking pictures. That was even weirder. I basically stopped using social media over this. After winter break, this continued. When my parents were at work, this guy came during the afternoon too. I had to call the cops a few times. They went and tried to talk to him, but he basically told them that he wasn't going to talk, and that was it. I think the cops really wanted to help, but they could never do anything about it because he was really careful to not actually break the law. Like, he didn't trespass, he didn't make any threats, he didn't show any weapons or anything like that. I have no idea what he's doing now. My guess is that he finally gave up. Maybe his little obsession kind of became old and he just found other things to pay more attention to. At least, I hope so. But if he still comes by, I have no idea. I think the most challenging thing is that I just couldn't tell my parents since I knew they would completely freak out. Last year, I was working a shift as a library tutor. My job is to workshop people's essays and help them improve their writing. It's normally pretty rewarding and you get to know some interesting people. Until I met this guy. The most uncomfortable I'd ever been was some dude hitting on me or this really religious girl trying to convert me during our session. I can deal with that kind of stuff. This dude was next level creepy. I don't believe in psychic impressions. So when I say this dude gave off bad vibes, 
What I mean is that I think his men and body language must have been sending my subconscious mind a lot of massive red flags straight off the bat, or something of the sort. Maybe he just really did emit evil psychic mojo. In any case, as soon as he sat down, I was immediately uneasy in his presence. He looked totally normal, kind of even handsome, very average. He had this kind of dead-eyed look and made way too much eye contact. He sat in an off-kilter position with one side facing away from me, his head not looking directly towards me. I tried to be super friendly and accommodating, thinking maybe he just seemed off to me because he was autistic or Asperger's, since I have a lot of autistic friends who also struggle with body language and eye contact. The whole time we talked, he had this weird little side smile, like he was amused by something I didn't know about. I read through his essay and the uneasy pit in my stomach grew. It was total nonsense, like absolute psychotic nonsense. It was like reading Time Cube. The grammar was terrible, the spelling was bad. Opinions would be inserted at inappropriate moments. The logic was super tangential and inconsistent. Still trying to be helpful, I asked him to go through sentence by sentence with me and talk through his ideas. We went through and painstakingly changed each sentence to attempt to thread some semblance of logic through the thing. It was only by like the third paragraph of this mess, reading through it the second time though, that I finally figured out what this essay was actually about. It was a book report on a piece of pro-Nazi fiction. He'd been given a write about any book you want to assignment, and the text he chose was this pro-Nazi book about this heroic soldier being oppressed after the war for his ideals and actions. It was absolutely Nazi propaganda, and this dude was high-key praising it for three nonsensical pages. I was now feeling extremely uneasy. I fall into quite a few demographics that the Nazis want to exterminate, and this dude had been making me feel really unsafe and uncomfortable without even doing anything so far. So I was walking on eggshells for the rest of the session. I helped him edit his Nazi essay and polish his Nazi thesis. I think if I had any foresight, I'd have intentionally sabotaged this paper on principle. But in the moment, I was just way too skeeved out to think a plan like that through. I just wanted him to leave. When he did finally leave, I noticed his backpack had a lot of patches with guns and other military imagery. That also creeped me out. I have friends who love big guns, and they're super chill. But in context, this unsettled me even more. There had been something about his voice, the way he talked, and his word choice that made me feel really uneasy as well. He spoke a little slowly without much emotion, and had a slight tilt to his speech that I recognized but couldn't place until later. I thought I'd heard his voice before, but I didn't know where. The next day, I realized that his speech patterns had sounded so familiar because I listened to a true crime podcast, which frequently has interrogation tapes, court tapes, and interviews with murderers. I like to research serial killers and true crime as a hobby. This dude had the same speech patterns, cadence, and emotionless delivery of the convicted serial killer's recordings. I hadn't even realized that serial killers had commonalities in their speech patterns until that very moment. This dude talked just like a murderer in an interrogation room. I can't describe it. Maybe I was overreacting, but I really do believe that our brains are really good at picking up on red flags, and this guy set off all of my alarms. I've never had such a strong, irrational gut reaction to somebody I've only just met before, and I never have again. When he walked away, I remember thinking, I hope he doesn't shoot up the campus. He gave off the distinct impression of somebody who would do something like that. I had to take a bath when I got home just to feel like I was clean. That's how skeevy this guy was. I actually forgot all about him until today, because I've been watching videos about Elliot Roger and Andrew Blaze, and both of them reminded me a lot of this guy I met in the library. I hope he dropped out and never comes back. This incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. So here's my story. 
I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, around 4.30 p.m., unlocked my door and then went inside. I set my phone, wallet, and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and I then began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was a habit for me to not lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through my bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry that I'd started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened, and I smiled with a surprise. My husband was home a little early, and I then happily called out to him. Hey love, I'm in here. I was met with silence and slowly began to feel that sinking feeling of something's wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me, and then I walked out into my living room and kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me. I would estimate 50s, but it's really hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment. But he was just standing there staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. I wondered if he'd maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized that I needed to do something other than just gape at the stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, which is hard to do as a small female. I then used a loud, clear voice telling him to get the hell out of my apartment, that he had no business being there. He completely ignored me like I hadn't spoken. Then he began to pick up my things. My phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and then put them into his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I then darted toward the only other device I had that would allow me to get help. My computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but still had about 12 to 15 feet between us, so I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me, and I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two long doors between us. My bathroom door and closet door. I slammed it and locked the first door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911 and tell them there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and then assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone and was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened, and the intruder then came inside. He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen. I was frozen with fear, with shock. I don't know, but I didn't scream or cry or search for a weapon in that darn closet. I did embrace the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled in my closet and waited to die, because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I'd screamed, someone would have heard and come to help, right? Surely there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop I had would hurt if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that, but the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back out into the living area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling that death was inevitable. I really felt awful about my selfishness at that moment, but I messaged my mom who lived a 15 hours drive away and I told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort and to tell her how much I love her. 
I'm not a parent myself, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through knowing that her daughter was in danger and that there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers that I loved them. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband shouting for me. The intruder walked out towards the living room and kitchen area again, and I opened the door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling, at times yelling, but never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during really scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time the officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way, by the way. It just always seemed like it was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report, telling them what happened. One of the officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time, or blaming me for what happened but I later realized his words were just coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen this situation indifferently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen again. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening. Please consider continuing, because this isn't all doom and gloom. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're still struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the lying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved into the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose a third floor apartment with one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that an isolated incidence of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often worked night shifts now, and I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't really changed anything other than locking my door, and I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, then introduced myself and started taking classes. At first, I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him, and he's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it's made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist anymore. I'm confident, I'm strong, and I'm worthy of living and protecting myself in my own home. I am no longer ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure that I'm safe. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize that this might not be a solution or option for everyone, your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happened to do it, and it's how it's worked out for me. Thank you again for listening. 
I'm a little afraid to share this because I'm not really sure how people will respond, but maybe doing so will help someone else that's feeling alone with this. Stay safe out there, everyone. This all started years ago. I was somewhere between 18 to 19 years old, and I'm in my mid-20s now. I was at one of the numerous parties my best friend at the time Dana was throwing. With her being the first of our friends to get her own place with her boyfriend Mike, pretty much every weekend there was some sort of party going on at their place, and of course her being my best friend, I was always there. As often as I went to her parties, there were only a handful of people that I knew personally, but I suppose that's normal with her moving to a completely different town about 45 minutes to an hour away depending on the traffic. I would typically work Mondays through Thursdays and head to her place on Fridays, party Saturday, then come home on Sunday. It wasn't out of the ordinary for Dana and her boyfriend to try and set me up with random people. To be honest, I was used to meeting a new guy pretty much every weekend. It was always the same line. He's perfect for you. You're gonna love him. And 9 out of 10 times, I really wasn't interested. So, this one particular party, I was having a grand old time doing shots in the kitchen with my tiny group of friends, then wandering out to the living room to socialize with all the new faces. I'm an extremely friendly and bubbly person, which is probably why my friends never worried about whether or not I would be uncomfortable on my own around the party. To this day, I've never met a person I didn't like at one of Dana's parties, except for Keith. I remember I had just finished playing beer pong with a group of new friends, and after losing by an embarrassing amount, I needed to cool it on the drinks and decided to plop down on the couch. I then heard a very friendly, well hello there, and I turned to see a guy no older than maybe 24 sitting next to me. There was nothing creepy looking about him. In fact, he wasn't bad looking at all. Light brown hair with honey colored eyes and a friendly smile. I don't believe we've met, he said with a friendly nod and turned his body to face me. I don't believe we've met either. I smiled and held out my hand, then introducing myself. We shook hands and he told me that his name was Keith. I was about to ask him if he was a friend of Mike's since he was around Dana's boyfriend's age. And while I can't remember who it was, one of my friends at that moment had come over to drag me off somewhere. I honestly have no idea where we went or anything seeing as I was drunk and this was years ago, but I remember quickly telling Keith that it was nice meeting him and I was sure I'd be seeing him again around that night before prancing off with my friend. I didn't see him for the rest of the night though, but didn't think anything of it. I was even crashing on their couch that night and didn't recall seeing him leave, but like I said, I didn't think anything of it. Flash forward a couple of days later, and my phone popped up with a text from a number that I didn't recognize. Hey, it's Keith from the other night. I'm really bummed we didn't get to spend more time together. Sad face. I read it, and it took me a few minutes before I could even remember who the hell Keith was. It wasn't out of the blue for me to get texts from people that I'd meet at parties, being the social butterfly that I am. However, whenever I do give out my number, I'll always do an exchange at that moment so I can write down who it is. So after a little bit of small talk, him asking how gnarly my hangover was the next day, and me asking how his current day was going, I had asked him how he got my number. He said he had asked my friend for it when he was getting ready to leave and couldn't find me to ask me himself. Assuming it was either Dana or Mike, I dropped the subject and started asking him more about him, and he about me. While I didn't necessarily see Keith as anything more than a friend, we began to talk regularly. He had the same sense of humor as I do, and he was a night owl like I was. He had quickly become one of my favorite people to talk to. A couple of weeks later, I was at another party at Mike and Dana's. I remember it was Mike's birthday and he wanted to do an 80s theme, so we all got dressed up and let the alcohol flow, and it was honestly a blast. At the peak of my drunkenness, I had yelled over the music to Dana who was right next to me if Keith was coming at all. Who? She yelled back as we danced by hopping around and tossing our extremely teased hair. You know, Keith! I yelled again, and she gave me a weird look. 
She kept saying she had no idea who that was, and when I tried to describe him, she yelled that she didn't know a Keith, and that really confused the hell out of me. When she noticed my energy shift, she quickly said that it was very likely that he could have come with our friend Rianne, since she was always bringing plus ones or plus twos. Immediately agreeing with her, I continued to dance the night away and down drinks that I would be regretting the next morning. Rianne had actually stayed over that night since she was in no shape to drive, so she took the couch while I made a little nest on the floor. When I had woken up early that morning to get some water, Rianne was getting ready to leave since she had to be somewhere semi-early that day, and she had a lot of hairspray to come out of her hair and a lot of blue eyeshadow to take off. I had quickly downed my glass of water and remembered what Dana had said about Keith. I asked her if she was the one who brought Keith the other week, and she just laughed and said, Yeah, I have no idea who the hell Keith is. I gave her a brief rundown of who he was and how we had been talking, and she apologized and told me again that she didn't know a Keith. While that should have been at least a teeny bit of a red flag, I still didn't think anything of it since I legitimately really enjoyed talking to him. The first few months, he was super cool. I had opened up to him about personal things that I had gone through, particularly my rocky relationship with my dad and my past messy, ugly romantic relationships. Keith was one of the only people I had really opened up to about one relationship in particular where I was being abused and didn't even fully realize it until he pointed it out to me. I genuinely felt Keith cared for me and wanted the best for me. It was comforting. Not long after that, he started to become more flirtatious with me. While I naturally have a somewhat flirty personality, even his advances were a bit much for me. I told him that I didn't want to give him the wrong idea because I wasn't looking to date anyone at that time, and I'd really just saw him as a good friend. He was clearly upset by the tone in his voice when I had told him, but he said he understood and that he was really glad we were friends. His texts and calls became a little more frequent after that, and while we already talked just about every single day, it was like the more I tried to explain that I didn't see him that way, the more he pushed it on me. I started to pull back on talking to him because as forward as I was about my feelings, I was still worried that I may have been leading him on. During this time of me pulling away, Keith had found my MySpace, which I hadn't used all that much by that point. It was when everyone was just beginning to switch over to Facebook. He would ask me questions about my family and say things like, In this picture, is that your friend? The majority of the questions he asked, I knew I had previously told him about those friends or family members, but there were a couple that I knew for a fact I hadn't mentioned, and somehow he knew who they were and my relationship to them, particularly a picture of my nephew, who at the time was still just a tiny baby. He said something along the lines of my nephew looking cute, but Keith knew his name. It struck me as somewhat creepy, but I tried to brush it off. Around this time, an old, very dear friend had recently come back into my life. His name was Max, and we were best friends when we were about 15. I had always had a crush on him, but I was just too shy to say anything, and after he moved, we lost contact. I randomly found him on Facebook, and while I was positive it was him, I sent him a message anyway calling him my old nickname that I had for him, with a ton of question marks and exclamation points. He was just as excited to hear from me as I was to find him, and things had instantly picked up right where we had left off. We spent all night messaging back and forth, and eventually texting, and then the all-night phone call started up again. As crappy as it was of me, I had unintentionally stopped answering Keith's texts and calls when Max came back into my life. The way I saw it was I had already lost him once, and I wasn't about to let that happen again. One late night while I was away at my uncle's for Thanksgiving, I was on the phone with Max and I told him that I always had the fattest crush on him when we were younger, but that I was just too terrified to say anything because I was really positive that he didn't see me the same way and that I didn't want to lose his friendship. He started laughing and he told me that he felt literally the exact same way and that's why he would always tell me that my friend Shannon was cute to not blow his cover. Feeling extremely bold in that moment of exhaustion, I told him I still felt that way, and that when we had lost contact, I had thought of him and wondered what he was up to, and he said he felt the same. 
I was totally overwhelmed with happiness. And he said that there wasn't anyone else that he had ever connected with quite like the connection that we had. Right at that moment, we decided to officially be a couple and started to figure out when I would be able to fly out to visit him. Things with Max were better than I could have ever imagined. Waking up to his good morning phone calls and texting all day and every day until it was time to talk on the phone until we fell asleep. I was over the moon and completely forgotten all about Keith. Christmas comes around and I call Max to wish him a Merry Christmas. He even passed the phone around so I could talk to his family who I'd also completely fallen in love with. We decided at the end of February I was going to fly out to spend a week with them. Late one night in the beginning of February, I got a call from Max's aunt. The moment my phone rang, I knew something wasn't right. We said hello, and when I asked if everything was okay, she burst into tears, absolutely hysterical, then telling me that Max had been in a car accident. I could feel my heart drop into my stomach, and I began to shake. I was so terrified to ask if he was okay, because I already knew the answer. I still remember every single detail about that day and night. I remember feeling something was off. I hadn't heard from Max in a few hours other than a post on my Facebook saying I love you. I still remember what I was wearing. I remember exactly where I was sitting and the position I was sitting in when I got the news. I remember dropping to the floor and having to use all of my energy to pull myself up and crawl into my mom's bed and tell her what happened. I just couldn't believe he was gone. I had lost my Max all over again. I didn't reach out to any of my friends for a long time, other than my closest friends who got the news and rushed to be by my side every second that they could. It really took me a while to come around again, but eventually I had started taking the steps that I needed to heal. I started going on outings with my friends. I started to eat more. Something in my mind had clicked that Max would never want me to waste my life like that. He always told me that we needed to make the best of our lives and that we had so many adventures awaiting us. That day, I decided to live my life to the fullest, not just for me, but for Max, which eventually led to me reaching out to Keith and apologizing for basically ghosting on him and that I really hoped there were no hard feelings. He forgave me, and while I knew better than to reach out too much, we were on a good note. Here and there, I would still get texts from him, sometimes just to say hello, but mostly they were. I saw this and it reminded me of you. Texts like that, whether it be something I liked or something related to one of our old inside jokes, nothing creepy at that point. A few months later, I had gone over to a friend's for dinner and while she and I were doing dishes afterwards, my phone began to ring. I saw it was Keith, so I picked up and gave a friendly hello, but instead of a hello back, he was breathing heavily and moaning, and even muttered a few weird sexual things that he wanted to do to me. I remember that I shrieked and laughed before screaming to stop because I thought he had dialed me by accident instead of whoever he was boinking at the time. I figured he would have been mortified and given me one of those, oh my god, I'm so sorry, type of apologies, and then we could go straight to laughing about it. But the breathing and moaning just continued, and I then froze in confusion and shock. When he came, he yelled out my name and let out a small chuckle, then tried to spark a conversation as if nothing had happened. What the hell was that? I yelled, and he was really surprised that I didn't enjoy it. At that moment, I was pissed. I told him, knock that crap off, before hanging up and going back to the dishes. After my friend let me vent about it, I felt a little bit better and decided that I would no longer reach out to Keith. On my way home, he had sent me a text apologizing, saying that he didn't know what came over him and that it was just drunken stupidity, blah, blah, blah. I told him that if he ever tried anything like that again, we were going to have a major problem. He apologized again, and I thought that would be the end of it. That's when the dick pics started rolling in along with more phone calls, and he even sent me a couple of videos. At that point, I really should have told somebody about it or gone to the police, or at the very least changed my number, but I was an idiot and I didn't. It was the only cell number I had ever had at that point, and I didn't want to go through the hassle of giving out my new number and all that junk to the tons and tons of people who I enjoyed talking to just because of one chode bag of a dude. 
The more I ignored Keith, the more aggressive he got, though. He would randomly send me pages of text explaining in great detail why I was a bitch, a whore, and every other awful name in the book that he called me. He said it was real disgusting of me to lead him on like that, and my family should be ashamed to be related to such an ugly whore. It was very hurtful, but I brushed it off. I have pretty thick skin, and I usually don't take things like that too seriously. When that approach didn't work, he got desperate. He sent me a text saying he was sorry and that he was really afraid because he didn't know what he was doing or what had come over him. I told him he needed to get some professional help. When he then said he wanted to die, I started to panic. I then called him and asked what was going on. I've always been a person to help out others in need no matter how bad our relationship is. After losing Max, I promised myself that I never wanted anyone to feel that sense of lonesomeness that I felt. Keith was crying saying that he was ready to die right then and there, that he had bottles of pills and a handle of booze sitting right in front of him, and it was taking everything in him to not down it all and be done with everything. I had never been so freaked out in my entire life. I had sat on the phone with him for hours and listed off reason after reason for him to stay alive. He eventually calmed down and thanked me before then apologizing again. I told him again that he needed to get some help and that it was okay to ask for it. He said I was right and that was the last I heard from him for the rest of that week. I went back to my normal life and I thought things were a-okay in my life again. But of course, since this is Reddit, Keith came around again. He went back and forth between aggression and desperation. One day it would be, I don't want to live anymore. And then the next it would be, you selfish bitch, I hate you. I was getting afraid and I had told a few friends about it and none of us had ever dealt with anyone this unstable before. We were all equally freaked out and we decided the next time he said anything, I was changing my number and telling someone who could do something about it. The very next morning, I woke up to an essay of a text message from Keith, telling me that everything I had ever said to him was a lie and I disgusted him. Nothing new there, but then I kept reading and I totally broke down. He went on to tell me that Max got what he deserved and that he had never been so happy to hear that someone died and that I should have been in that car with him. I should have survived so I could have been the one to pull his body from the wreckage and have that horrible memory burned into my brain forever. Now look, insult me all you want, but the very second you start to talk crap about my dead boyfriend, you are done. You're dead to me. While my dad and I don't have the best relationship, he was the first person that I thought to call. He answered immediately, and when he heard me sobbing, he went into complete protector mode asking what happened. I told him the whole story and that I didn't know what to do. He told me to give him Keith's number and he would take care of it. The second we hung up, I sent him his number and within half an hour, my dad texting me saying, this is your new number and your brothers and I are taking care of the rest of the problem. I'm the youngest girl in my family and all of my brothers are over six foot. Two of them heavily tattooed and the other one used to be in the Navy and is now a cop. I honestly have no idea what they said or did to Keith, but after that, I never heard from him ever again. A couple of weeks after I talked to my dad, I had looked up Keith on Facebook to block him and make sure that he could never contact me on there as well. It's been years now, and I'm happy to say that my life is as back to normal as it could be. I still have no idea to this day who gave him my number or if he had possibly had it already. It's possible that he was in fact a friend of a friend, but I feel it's not likely. Dana and Mike have split since then, so I never got a chance to ask Mike about it, but I'm more than happy to move on from it. I don't really know if his intentions were to just scare me, or if he would have done something much worse had it continued. Hey everyone, that's about it for today's stories. If you have your own story that you would like to send, you can send it in at southerncannibal.com or you can email it at southerncannibalstories at gmail.com. I look forward to telling your story. Have a good night or good day, everyone. And remember, to always.